Great. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, this wonderful episode. I'm not calling in the Shaft episode because it's it's a very unique episode that we are going to do. And so let me just give you a gist about it. There are two powerful giants of debate podcasts you can find in the debate world right now. Um, there is one that we call Pioneers of Debate Podcast, which I saw, um, which is it's not just a debate podcast, but it's also a strategy in debate that's pretty effective. And the pioneers of it are, are masters of it as well. Um, so on this episode, we have a collaboration episode with Structural Reasons, um, together with Nikki and Rumen, who will talk a lot about um, our collective debate journeys, who will talk about our inspirations for debate podcasts, and why we love doing this um, as much as we do it. So welcome. Uh, first, let me just go to Nikki. Nikki, how are you feeling today? And and what's up on this episode? Um, I'm I'm feeling great. I'm feeling great. Excited um, mainly to to talk with you. Not so much with Roman. I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm fine with uh, with not spending some time with him. Uh, but uh, it is what it is. Uh, and hopefully it, we get to some uh, fun and juicy topics today. Yeah, yeah, uh, Roman, I. I want to apologize to Nikki for putting you guys together, but I want to know whether you have the same feeling as he as he does. Oh no, I love spending time with him. How could you tell? <laughs> <laughs> so, so one is the clingy one, and then the other one is the isolated one. So that's Basically. that's a fun dynamic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Erasmus will be joining us um, later down the line, but so let's let's start the conversation. Why did you guys decide to partner up to begin with? Because R Nikki clearly doesn't want to spend time with you. You want to spend time with him. Who convinced who to partner the, the other person? Uh, you should tell the story. I think it would be best from your perspective. <laughs> um, okay. Um, let's let's see. It's, it's a it's a long story, but I, I'll yeah. try to. I'll try to take away the main points of it because uh, I think those will be the most interesting. Um, okay. So me, me and Roman, we go back uh, to 2016, probably. In 2016, wow. we were only doing uh, debating. We were high school kids uh, in here in Bulgaria. Okay. Um, I think essentially what i can say for that time is that we were both very competitive and very um trial and error into understanding how debating works and okay. uh, this is important to understand because uh, once we decided to compete we already had some um, years of debating but at the same time yeah. we had to completely rebuild ourselves uh, from the okay. get go, so so it was a important decision to make in that uh, in that kind of sense, and I think the most interesting part is uh, I got inspired uh, personally to do the more debating when I got yeah. to meet uh, the people um, on the CA team of uh, Athens UDC, who are doing okay. an event in Bulgaria called the Balkan Debate Academy. Uh, oh. And uh, talking with them, I realized that I still have a passion for it, even though up to that point, I've only been to a few internationals and I was uh, largely unsuccessful, wasn't really uh, doing it seriously. And actually, uh, back in 2018, we completely decided to never go to internationals because we had such a bad time. Um, so I went to Athens UDC, very last yeah. decision, um, and I got to experience my first major, and that really helped uh, with solidifying my idea that I really want to do it. Yeah. So, so after that. Uh, I actually uh, started thinking about who I should partner with. Um, yeah. I think Roman was uh, my second choice. Uh, <laughs> if Ooh. I have to be, if I have to be honest. Uh, but uh, interesting. Uh, who was the first choice? So the first choice was uh, actually uh, a friend of ours called uh, Dario. 
Okay. Um, but uh, to be honest, uh, with Dario, I only thought about it superficially and we had a conversation about it and he was really not into it. So we didn't really have a, um, it, 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 it was not going to be a thing most likely anyway. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, but I did think of Dario because uh, he's a very calm person and somebody who is very, uh, um, I, I would say joyful to a certain extent, somebody who will probably yeah. not, not get uh, um, too caught up in the pressure, but at the same time is uh, still very competitive. Um, oh, okay. But yeah, then I went to 180 degrees in the other direction, somebody who is not <laughs> joyful, somebody who is... Uh, uh super super stressed all of the time um but uh it uh, it brings out the best in uh debate perspective and definitely we've had some moments i think yeah. the highlight of that uh, whole journey was uh, the conversations and uh i think uh the fact that at, it, it i think roman took some convincing Especially uh -huh. since he's a person, he's more of a person that when he says he's done with something, he's he's mainly done with it. He's done, uh -huh. except except if it's debating. <laughs> I am I am I am the other way around. I I change my my mind all the time on things. Okay. So it, it it got some convincing, but I think I gave him like actual structural reasons why we should do it. Ten. Ten structural reasons. Yeah, there were ten structural amazing. reasons, uh, <laughs> and um, yeah, I think I think after that we just decided to do it, and uh, the rest is kind of history. But yeah, Ruman, yeah. I I, told, I just told the story of how you were my second option after Dario, <laughs> uh, so just just wanted to to quickly brief you in on that part if you want to have some reactions. It is the the right summation of events. <laughs> Did you also explain how you promised me we would go to Korea and Kazakhstan and the pandemic happened? No, uh, you can you can tell you can explain what I promised you and how how, how did I scam you? It was my first so, debate uh, scam. So so you know how Nikki when he debates he does this thing with his arms. Yeah, this, yeah. Uh, the magic move. Yeah. Uh, the first time he used it on me was when he explained it's fine we'll just go to like oxford in cambridge great tournaments extremely good tournaments those are the only prep tournaments we have to do you, you see you see i was then, already lying from the get-go lying from the get-go <laughs> then we're going to do kazakhstan and uh, korea and look we will probably break uh esl at at the very least but even if we don't break we're gonna have like great uh like a great time there it's a trip yeah i i don't remember the other eight reasons but those are the two that i remember because they were complete <laughs> lies both of them so yeah it's it's funny how it's more like a negotiation that I had to go on to get you two to partner up because myself and erasmus was was an entirely different dynamic we Erasmus coached me in debate when I when I was when I joined debate in 2018. He was uh, a pretty a pretty advanced member of the debate society, so he was training me in first year. So the first time I heard about prime minister, leader of opposition, everything I knew in BP started with Erasmus, and he coached me through. I think about two or three months. We have this freshest competition that we do only for freshmen and newbies in debates. And then we did that. I, I made semis. I lost. I cried my eyes out. <laughs> Literally said, I, I'll probably not do debate again because it wasn't paying me even after three months. And and then I went. He invited me to do a, a, the first open competition with him, Ghana Eastes. And then we won. So once we won, I became this arrogant uh, kid on the block who had gone to his first open competition and won. And then... We stopped partnering. Occasionally, we would partner, but we never really decided to partner until, I think, 2021. When December there, we said, oh, I think that time online era has, has come to stay. We said, look, if we, if we decide to do competitions, we can build ourselves. We can build an identity. We can grow. And so for us, both of us were pretty much interested in going on the journey. Unlike Nikki, who had to cook up 10 structural reasons with 
unassured trips and tickets that were never bought to convince to con to convince women to to get you to partner. But individually, I'm I'm interested in whether or not your inspir your inspirations or your motivations for debaters are, are different. I, I think everybody tends to have different reasons why they engage in debate. When I started debating, it was merely to win an argument and to prove a point. Because I had entered, I was in a class with, not in a class, in the same department with my department president who was a debater. And we used to argue a lot. And then he dared me that if I joined the debate society, people in there would just beat me left, right, center because I was just making noise without without proving anything. And so I took him up on the challenge to just join the debate society to lash the people he was training. And that freshest competition, I did lash his star man back to back. And so even though I didn't make seven, I didn't make finals and I cried, I was still satisfied because I achieved my goal. <laughs> I went there to prove a point and I did prove the point. That's what got me into debate. But eventually, of course, my motivations evolved over time. I'm just interested in knowing what, what got you into debate, um, Nikki. Let's see, let's see. I think um, it's, it's multiple things along the way. So yeah. for, for example, um, the motivation when I started doing international competitions was entirely different than the motivation from the get-go. Um, okay. Uh, it's, it's, it's still, in essence, it's being very competitive. So when you yeah. decide that you want to do something and you like something, uh, if it's the competitive environment, uh, if you're just that type of person, it, it just happens. Uh, so yeah. that's, that's one part of it. I think that kind of most people share, uh, from, for me, um, at, at the start, it was something that I had uh, natural uh, proclinations to, if I can say it like that. Um, yeah. I, I enjoyed uh, speaking in front of people. I was uh, uh, fairly good at uh, having some form of style without, or at least it came more natural to me. And yeah. that made it feel fun and it made it look like something that I want to do. Uh, after that, I stayed for the people. Uh, yeah. And uh, I stayed because I realized that uh, these natural skills that I have can only get me so far. And after yeah. that, it's uh, a lot of hard work uh, that other people have done before me or have done to a certain level. And I wanted, yeah. to, I wanted to do that. So it's kind of different motivators of different parts of the journey i would say yeah apart from the main thing main thing is i really love doing it and i really enjoy yeah. it especially the speaking part the judging yeah. part not so much uh but uh there are extra motivators along the way so firstly i was motivated okay. to become the best in bulgaria then yeah. i was motivated to have a social impact in Bulgaria to a certain extent. Yeah. So more organizational stuff, more coaching, uh, all of those things. Then I was again, I, I started missing the competitive part. So I was again motivated to become uh, good internationally. And then yeah. that transpired into me wanting to become uh, the best in the world. So that's kind yeah. of how it goes. And now I'm back again, uh, horseshoe theory into... <laughs> Uh, I, I actually enjoy more uh, the social aspect of it and yeah. more, you know, people get into it than actually uh, competing. Uh, so it's a, it's a full circle for me. Yeah, yeah. That's quite interesting, though. Uh, Ruben, what about you? I'm, I'm not sure. Nikki's motivation sounds very, very structured layered and noble mine is very haphazard so I'm, I'm interested in hearing yours whether you also follow a full circle or you don't have a circle at all oh yeah i do it's uh it, it's basically evolutionary it's the same yeah. way as he uh, explains it to where we're in the final part where we're trying to do an impact for the community uh, yeah. if you couldn't tell so far but uh actually my motivations even though they follow the same structure are a bit different so when i started yeah. debating uh, in high school, it was because I couldn't talk in front of people. I was a very shy kid. Oh, okay. uh, and actually, like, my first speech uh, was, like, below two minutes. So 
I, I spent one year just uh, learning how to talk to pe- uh, in front of people and probably to talk to people as well because, you know, wow. uh, I was a weird kid back then. So, like, kids, if you're watching, uh, if you start from two-minute speeches, you can become world's finalist. And I'm not even joking about this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. But uh, honestly, my main intrinsic motivation is, uh, and to, let, let's spice it up a bit, is probably pure yeah. hatred. Uh, by this, I mean, I, I really want to beat people. I, I, yeah. I, I am an inherently competitive person. Yeah. I, I enjoy competition. I enjoy a good fight. I enjoy, like, a, for example, last weekend was LSE Open. The yeah. only round I felt good was the round where I was uh, in front of, like, debaters who uh, I deem uh, that are, like, truly at an exceptional level. Uh, and uh, it was a challenge, which was the semifinals. Because yeah. you know, I was debating Kaito Harish, uh, Jack Sinot, uh, Mark, uh, yeah. Anikit and Zarina. And, like, I felt this this thrill in yeah, me yeah. Uh, come up. And, uh, yeah, and uh, this thrill uh, more or less doesn't come up these days. And that's why I don't speak that much. But this is the inherent reason for why yeah. I did I mean, it's, it's, it's similar. For me, I, I generally stop at a stage when I feel I don't have anything to prove. And so it, when I started debating in Ghana, there was a lot of competition I felt the edge, the drive to win, win, win. I never won a Ghanaian nationals. I tried and tried and tried. Never happened. Even Pan-African championships, made semifinals, made finals twice. Still never won. But then during that phase, until I felt, look, I'm satisfied. I don't need to prove anything. I wouldn't stop. And so the only time at which I gave up on Ghanaian nationals was, I don't think I need to win it to prove a point anymore. And then I felt internally satisfied, so I stopped. Um, Pan-African Championships reached a point. I felt I don't need to prove it to win anything anymore. Uh, and then I stopped. And then my eye turned to, to develop um, international presence, try to break into the international scene, and then pick up more challenges. And that has been thrilling. I mean, nowadays I do less comps, mainly because of work, but also because, like, for instance, a comp in Ghana, a comp in Africa, there are some very competitive ones, but a lot of them are also filled with new and upcoming speakers. And if I go there, it almost sounds like you are unchallenged. The last comp I did in Ghana, which was a crowd pin, I went almost perfect, um, just dropping one point, and it was it was like, ah, it's not, it's not that thrilling anymore, right? And for me, just like Rumen says, it's the mental stimulation that I get from it. It's like sitting down prepping a strategy for a tough debate and knowing that you pulled it off, you predicted someone in one small extra step that they didn't anticipate coming. And then you have that little edge over them and then hit them and then you get that thrill, that fun of it. And so it's, it's, it's for me, it's just feel happy within the moment. Today I've been a little bit bubbly because my kids won a quarterfinal round against one of the best schools and once we drew against them everybody said oh now you guys are losing and i said oh, I, I like this because that's fun because then i put in a lot more work and then when we beat them i know the magic worked right so it's it's just being in it because it makes me feel alive it makes me feel great as well um for you, Rumen, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing this because it's pure hatred and I want to beat people. I'm doing it because it gives me mental stimulation. Yours is different. <laughs> so, so I'm a little bit better than you at that point. But, I mean, you guys turned your attention to international debating. Let me just try to understand how, what challenges did you face trying to break into the international scene? Because I tend to see that there is a big difference between local circuits and international, the international circuits, and at least those who dictate debate in the international circuit expect debaters to to analyze things in certain ways, to debate in certain ways. And and sometimes you can stick with your individual style. You'd have to do a lot to establish that style as an acceptable one, or you just try and conform and try and adapt the things that everybody's expecting you to do, and then you can go through it. Some of them are difficult because we have different upbringings within debate in terms of the circuits we come from and the cultures around debate in there. But generally, what challenges did you face and, and how did you work your way around them? If, if you start on this one, Rumen. Uh Yeah, there are actually many of them, but I will start with the one that uh, brought me most pain. Like, uh, yeah. this is... 
this is for sure it uh when we started every time we were closing yeah uh like not every time but we would be deemed derivative which was yeah. just super strange for us uh in terms of some judges just yeah. uh they hear like an opening team say a word <laughs> or, or like a sentence yeah. and yeah. then you actually like sit down you can see you know, it you again the point with yeah. yeah with premises and things like that and analysis and they're like oh that you're you're just a straight up derivative uh yeah. which was like and back then this was in the mix idea era so you if, if oh was, yeah you know, yeah like, yeah uh, yeah debating in that in yeah i think uh where we had random sparse uh, in 2020 yeah. it was truly horrible the way we overcome it was like and like this i talk about in the other episodes you have to like basically force it on yourself to so that it becomes physically impossible for the judge to yeah. not give it to you. So like being derivative is one example, but basically what I did was I dropped rebuttal, I dropped framing, I dropped everything. It was just, this is what they say. This is why it's not enough. This is why the thing that we're adding is more, which now like I can do like this. It's not very yeah. hard, but back then this was like uh, honing your, your sword <laughs> your, your so skills. that it finally yeah. becomes sharp. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. uh yeah, I guess this was like the thing that it might not have been the hardest thing, but it's the thing that's deeply in my memory. Yeah. And I'm sure Nikki also remembers it. I, I I have a different perspective on this, especially now that I think about it. Um, I, I, I feel all of these uh, initial issues are part of one big problem, which yeah. was uh, the ability to articulate what you want to explain um, yeah i think a lot of uh, debaters in our positions especially if they are uh, not native speakers uh it takes a while for you to be able to express uh correctly yeah. your thoughts and actually get to the point especially in a way that uh, it's effective so um what happens is during this process, you have similar thoughts and ideas. Obviously, yeah. over time, you get uh, more ideas, if I can yeah. say it like that. You learn more stuff about the world, but you're, you still have the same thoughts and ideas uh, that you had in the first place. It's just that now you're able to articulate them much better. So, yeah. and, I, and, I, and I think this is... Um, this is kind of the fun part of it uh, for me, um, especially after I had broken at Euros and Worlds. Uh, yeah, it 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 wasn't so clear to me why I should continue proving myself and why I should continue competing. Uh, and the biggest reason is that I wanted to prove my own brand of debating, to uh, to to show okay. people that the way that I do it is. Uh, if not the best way, it's definitely a good way to do it. Uh, okay. So, so I, I'm telling this because I think uh, people get frustrated in that period and they, yeah. uh, they start becoming uh, like everybody else. Yeah. And this is bad. This is yeah. the moment where you need to reinvent a version of yourself that is good. So you need to keep the same attitudes. You need to keep the same ideas. You just need to be better at the tools that you use to express those ideas. So you get better okay. at the articulation part, at the explaining part, yeah. at the packaging yeah. of an argument part, uh, of how you explain uh, uh, how your argument uh, conflicts with others in the debate. Yeah. But at the core of the thing that we of the conversations about the world that we have about the uh, ideas and approaches to a certain extent of course strategy it evolves to a certain extent but what we yeah. like and what we don't like i think it's very similar to when yeah. we were yeah. debating uh, at the start and when we're debating now it's just now we really really know what we want and we really, really know what we like and yeah. we just do it and uh, we don't care about what everybody else thinks because we have proven it works. Back then, yeah. it's an almost constant struggle between what you think you should be doing and what you want to be yeah. doing and what are your ideas. And I think this is when you can 
you, 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 don't, you have to win that fight. This is the most important fight because then you become yourself as a debater and you're not just another uh, NPC out there that is trying to become the next X, Y, or Z. All of yeah. the very good debaters that I can think of right now, almost all of them are different and unique, even if they have yeah. similarities uh, between them. Yeah. Yeah, so, sorry for... Uh, uh, no, it's, 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 it's good. Get the details out there because I, yeah. I, I, I've had a, an experience in there. For me, those, that period, to some extent, was crushing. Like it was... My, my first world's experience was Korea online. And I've always said it's the single competition I felt as every round went on, I felt more and more being pressed down as if there was a wall bricks packed on my back, just pressing me down. And after every round, whether or not I did better in, than I did in the previous round or I did worse, every single round just kept making me feel horrible and horrible because I kept on hearing things that told me your approach wasn't good, your approach wasn't working, your approach, even if it was a win, it's probably because someone did worse rather than you did well. And so those perceptions and those ideas, and even to some extent, Belgrade Worlds was was also very tough on us because I, t I told you most recently that we went on a rampage of applying feedback we got in the previous round, in, immediately in the next round, without thinking whether or not it actually fits the motion or whether or not it actually fits the circumstance in that round. And I ended up discovering that even the basis of debate that we are taught is fundamentally different across board. Like today we hear things like things as basic as maybe when you are proving an argument, you need to prove plausibility and you need to prove probability. And if I try to track back the most basic argumentation process that every um, Ghanaian or every African was taught back in my day in, in, in starting debate was only doing the probability, the probability analysis where you are building steps to show that this thing can happen, but has nothing to do with is it happening as a part of 17 other possibilities and which one is most likely to happen and which one is most likely to generate this impact. And so you realize that when we entered the international scene, were so fixated on plausibility and you'd end up and somebody just comes and says, yeah, you proved it, but it's improbable. And then that's the entire battle they need for your case. And that took a lot to learn and to admit that you need to go through the reinvention phase. And a lot of the time it's, it's very, very difficult to, to take a grasp on it, to learn and even to know what you are doing wrong, unless you have people who can identify and tell you. And we had to learn how to start asking the right questions because I remember we in Pranav, Pranav used to tell us, guys, we, guys, we are, what do you mean we in? Because I thought we in was, this is what they said, this is what we said. And so what do you mean by we in? Until I got to start understanding, oh, there are metrics of we in, or there's this about we in, or there's that about we in. And so it's not that the debate terms don't exist, even sometimes the interpretation of those terms and the expectation from different circuits of what you need to do to meet the demands of those terms. Back then in my circuit, if you said, this is what they did and this is what we did, that was weighing. And so if I went out there into the international world and I did it and you told me I didn't weigh, then I'm confused because all my life, all I've known is weighing is just stating what they said and stating what we said. Right. So what you said is really, really true. Um, and I hope a lot of people just find the courage to to now ask for help, to also be much more specific with the kind of help that they ask for, instead of saying, give me feedback, and the judge says, you needed to weigh, probably need to go a step further and ask, how or what exactly do you mean by weighing? Can you give me an example of it so I know exactly what you are referencing? And then we can pick up and start learning from there. But you guys did, did the unthinkable broke first at, at WDC. Um, and and we're we're very very classy in the final how how did you feel about it did you sense this coming when you were approaching wdc nikki i dreamt it <laughs> i literally dreamt it wow three three days before i got on the plane I really came, yeah 
okay. I, I had a dream. It it happened exactly like in my dream. So, so wow. you know, <laughs> that's an unexpected answer, but it's true. Uh, yeah, obviously, obviously, very, yeah. very, 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 very shocking. Nikki, did it? Um, Ruben, did he tell you about the dream? Yeah, yeah, it was pretty funny. As all things with us are, uh, we we took a wizard flight because, like, that's what we do, and yeah. uh, we were put together. We didn't buy our seats; we were at random put together. So we spent oh. four hours like flying and discussing. And one of the points of discussion was whether or not the dream <laughs> manifests into reality uh, in this moment and how it played out. And yeah. I was like, yeah, I believe it. I see it as well now. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I mean, when, when I saw you guys do Brick Fest, because to be fair, going into the competition, um, not a lot of people were talking about you. Not a lot of people were, were talking about you as part of the top contenders. And you know, there's this atmosphere that builds up we around know. worlds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there's this atmosphere that builds up around worlds where people go to the competition and before the competition, there's this background chit chat around who is likely to be in the finals, who is likely to win, who is likely to be the most competitive. And you guys were in there. And for me, I've, I've always said this to Erasmus, seeing you guys go into those competitions as absolutely no favorites and end up breaking first and dominating the competition the way you did is what motivates me to still pursue world still today because then it tells me i don't need to have the entire world thinking i was i'm going to break first at world i don't need to have everybody chit chatting in their private dm saying i'm going to break up at worlds i just need to show up there and then do it and and that completely changed my perspective on what I should be looking out for in my approach to to some of these big aspirations that I have on a personal front. And so just how did you feel about it? And I just want to know your first experience in, in top room beating some of the top guys. What was the reaction? Because I'm wondering, lots of people will be wondering, maybe the first time they are like, yeah, it's luck. Maybe the second time, mm, blame a judge. But then the third time, no, these guys are dominating. Because then you need to come back to your senses. So I wasn't there, but what was the reaction to, to the dominance as it's built up and then finally as it was established in the competition? So you, you have to understand one very important piece of context. Yeah. For Madrid WDC. Yeah. Uh, the mornings were early, but the okay. morning on the 31st was the earliest. Our morning okay. routine at Worlds would consist of uh, us waking up and just standing, sitting uh, at the beds, slowly drinking coffee in the dark, uh, getting our power ready. And the yeah. 31st was the worst. I couldn't even get up to make the coffee. Nikki made the coffee. I was like, here, bro, have some. <laughs> and we go there. Uh, we have a second coffee. And yeah. I think the debate literally starts at like 7.30. My wow. mind was like not functioning then I see this like Taiwan, Taiwan motion in China yeah. and I'm like, aha, okay, so this is what <laughs> we're, we're doing right now. And as we were prepping, yeah. it felt like this energy in me like it's coming out. Opened, opened up. Yeah. yeah, my mind was clear. I don't know if it was the hour that uh, just <laughs> the hour passed and finally I could do it. And then after that, I felt this rush that yeah. to this day, I have never felt ever like this must be the best the best day in my debating career ever all of the rounds yeah. and that's why I'm super mad that they're not recorded I felt like as if almost I was flying uh yeah. when I was like uh doing the speeches everything was like so perfectly well made yeah and everything was and we 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 were just debating we weren't even thinking that much about uh uh, like little things, like all strategy things like that. No, we were just doing it, and we were trying. We were trying to win, and we did it. And to me, honestly, this may sound weird, but it wasn't a surprise that we broke first. Like obviously, I was, I was happy. I couldn't believe my mind. Yeah. But the way that the day played out, I kind of felt that this was what was going, going to, to happen. Likely happen in the end. So that yeah. was like my my day of the thirty first. Yeah, Nikki. Nikki, he his mind opened up all of a sudden, but you are the one with the dream. So I want to know what you felt on the thirty first. Um, in sports, there is this concept uh, called the zone. Yeah, and, uh, it's uh, essentially the zone is when you're so focused. Uh, it's 
it's usually seen in professional athletes in important moments of their professional career and yeah. it's uh, defined by uh, extreme focus on doing something like getting that hit uh putting that uh, uh, bow in the basket or something like that it's just yeah. extreme focus where your mind and body are completely aligned and focused on achieving this one specific thing and i, yeah. I think this is what uh um this is what was uh, essentially happening on the on day three uh i think our averages are like 87 for the day or something like yeah. that um and yeah we, we were just clicking firing firing on all cylinders and uh it's 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 not really i cannot completely explain it but you're you're just entirely focused on on one specific thing which i think is kind yeah. of rare and that's why we remember it uh so clearly because in 21st century 2024 you're never really focused you're over the place <laughs> yeah yeah TikTok, yeah something yeah else, you know uh, so uh, uh, achieving this high level of focus, is, uh, especially from my perspective, uh, was was definitely a very memorable thing and it's kind of like a feeling that uh, you, you you cannot truly replicate, uh, especially because um, it's it's uh, it's a build up of circumstance because you're in that moment. I cannot go to even LSE Open and. Uh, have the same care and uh, focus yeah, uh, yeah. for winning that competition as much as I was for that particular world. Because for yeah. me, it was obvious that this is going to be my last world. Uh, I I burned my bridges to not do anything after that. And uh, um, it was basically, it's it's the way that uh, I finished my my speech around nine. It's It was... I was accept, uh, accepting the fact that this is going to be my last worlds. This is going to be yeah. the last day three of importance that I already uh, uh, or like last day, uh, last round of importance that I already have. And around yeah. nine, I literally finished uh, with, uh, uh, and for the last fucking time, I'm proud to oppose. And that was pretty much wow. it. And never, yeah. never looked back. Never looked back. And that's. Uh, that that's some strength and and some relief at the same time because I I know sometimes making these decisions is is a bit tough especially if you love the competitive aspect of the game, but then once you're able to do it, it, it comes with some relief and and some I don't know it's like a, a part of a burden or aspiration that you have on you is, is all of a sudden lifted or ticked as done, and then that gives you some amount of relief. You both of you have returned back to the social aspect and and part of that is also um structural reasons this time around not the 10 that you gave to rumen but a podcast which which you started to talk about debate issues to also platform the voices of many people and and i'm sure there's a, a unique reason why you decided to choose podcasts um and specifically also narrow it down to debate podcast i just want to get a sense among the two of you why debate podcasts to begin with um why not any other thing because you, you could have done literally you guys are very knowledgeable you could have done podcast about anything you wanted yeah nikki uh i like podcasts i think they're fun i think they're yeah. a very good medium to explore what people are thinking about it's the best it's the next best thing to having a conversation with somebody uh, yeah. interviews are scripted they are yeah. put down and uh, they usually uh, don't show you what type of person is the person that is being interviewed the yeah. only close thing to actually having a conversation and there are many people out there in the world whom i would like to have a conversation with but uh, are not rarely available so the next yeah. big thing for me is listening to a podcast and uh, seeing how that person, be it, I don't know, fucking Elon Musk to being uh, Ashish uh, uh, in debating, to actually yeah. understand how they think, how they perceive around the world. 
are they somebody who is fun uh, to be around? Do they make jokes? Yeah. Do they uh, have certain ideas? And it allows you to also go a little bit deeper into how how they perceive the world uh, in an unfiltered manner, uh, yeah. which, uh, which I really, really enjoy. And I think debating as it itself has these same individuals. It's, it's really yeah. about the individuals. They're the driving force of the community. Uh, yeah. And uh, I didn't find anything else. Uh, I, I also want to mention that the direct inspiration was the Old Man and the Tree podcast, which is a basketball podcast. Um, oh. And it's not, there isn't really something about that po- podcast beyond the fact that it's uh, the first uh, podcast that I really got into that was uh, led by an NBA player talking with oh, other okay. NBA players. And yeah, I really yeah, found yeah. fascinating these conversations because they're quite different. Uh, if you're listening to somebody who hasn't played in the NBA, talking with somebody, yeah. you know, yeah. and it, it, it's the same concept here. It's, uh, it's from my perspective, I think I can have an interesting conversation with somebody who has also been a very competitive and achieved good things in debating because I've also done that. So I can... Yeah cut out some of the bullshit, but also provide interesting uh, questions and perspectives. Um, yeah. So that, that's that's kind of why. That's that's interesting. Rumen, um, what about you? Why, why debate podcasts? I think uh, there's a very simple way to explain this, which is like uh, a lightning trapped in a bottle uh, as a buzzword. But this is how I feel at this. Yeah. Uh, w- I think my most favorite moment, uh, it's a pretty weird one, maybe, maybe people won't yeah. agree, is when Ayal, in, in the second episode with Ayal, yeah. uh, where he explains uh, back in the day how he and Dan used to debate and the whole moment yeah. where he would explain framing. And yeah. I was there is this meme, like literally, you know, like you are the child and there's the old man there yeah. who's telling you the story. This is how I felt. Because oh. like... This is uh, the original point of something that's like super, super crucial to me yeah. uh, in uh, in debating. And I think this is like one, most likely one of the first times, maybe not the first times, but like back in the day how it was used. Yeah, and yeah. This to me is like, this is just an example, but this to me truly is a lightning trapped in a bottle if you're able to conserve it, codify it and uh, showcase it. So people in 2060 are watching it and yeah. go like, aha, this is how it was like. Yeah. yeah, I guess yeah, that's how yeah. I would explain it. Yeah, I mean that's that's it's quite similar. Um, the shaft was was mainly pushed by Erasmus. Um, he because I was also trying to have probably much more social conversations, but not debate specific. So I had started um, the Understanding Africa series. It was a Twitter space where we discussed a lot more in detail about african countries um what were their history their political background um their economic background and then use that to get a detailed sense of where they are now and where they could be what challenges they could face so it was mainly trying to profile from top to bottom african countries but it was a bit challenging because it was a live space and sometimes network sometimes some of the speakers um, their microphone or connectivity is, is not great and even after you record it on Twitter Spaces, it's so difficult trying to get it through the production line because it's uh, not meant primarily for recording and production. And so it's a lot more difficult. Um, and so when he, he spoke to me about the podcast, I was like, yeah, great idea. We dragged our feet around it. And then eventually we said, you know what, let's try one episode and then let's see how it goes. We tried one and realized oh, that wasn't that hard. Let's try another. And then we tried, we tried again. But his motivation mainly has been that there are a lot, because he has been within the space for much, much longer than I have been. And I think he's probably one of the oldest within the longest deb- debaters who have stayed very active across multiple generations, probably across four or five debate generations that I have seen. Um, and he knows some of these stories and just wonders how 
quickly history and debate achievements and and the greats slip through the, the cracks without people ever noticing what they did and what their motivations were in their stories and all that so she he wanted more to tell the stories of of africa's best debaters um, and also because the world a lot of the world doesn't know any greats from africa faithfulness um kumbi Bwachinya Meche Isaac, David e. Jim. Um, these guys are people who probably never got the chance to do worlds or a lot of opens, not online. But when we grew up, they were the ones who were philosophizing for us to listen to. Right. So he the, the shaft was meant to to sort of tell these stories. Um, we've done that in part, we continue to do that. Now we're also trying to divert a little bit to be much more social focused in terms of the conversations we are having relevant to debate but not limited to debate um, but having it solely with debaters so we get to have debaters share their perspective on their areas of expertise and then talk more about um, what those areas are, are, um, are about so that's mainly the motivation behind it for me i like it because i like talking uh, especially because i get to talk a lot <laughs> like on on these episodes as well it's just been fun but uh, there's one question i wanted to ask I, I have been on this journey not that long but i've had very unique discoveries i mean rumen you mentioned like your probably your favorite moment on the podcast as well um what has been your most unique discovery um as a podcaster since you started this journey i can tell you what i most certainly hate about doing the podcast I think yeah that's more interesting uh it's it's the part where people think that uh since now since you've created basically a platform uh, yeah. you need to adhere to certain types of rules that somebody thinks uh this is how it should be done or something like that yeah uh, and yeah. and this really really pisses me off uh, a lot <laughs> it really pisses me off uh i want to, to tell this to people um fuck you if you think that you have the right to tell me who i should have a podcast with or not uh this is like because because uh you know i i tried to approach it very diplomatically at first and was like it's fine we have time we're gonna talk with everybody no no fuck you i'm not gonna talk with everybody <laughs> i don't want to talk with everybody i want to talk with people who i yeah. find interesting and uh it, that's it that, that's that's yeah okay. it's not uh yeah. it's not the feminism podcast where each guest each second guest has to be uh, a woman and each first guest has to be a man or something like that i really hate that part like uh, people calling me out on, uh, hey guys, uh, why isn't Nikki uh, getting any female debaters on the podcast? Like, fuck you uh, for thinking that this has anything to do with how I structure these meetings. 90% of the time is about opportunity on the spot. When yeah. I have time, who I have time, you're not paying yeah. me any money. It's not very profitable for me to do it. It's still a great content and you're still complaining. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, this, this was my little rant on that, but uh, I really hate it because it's unproductive. And it doesn't really yeah. matter. Like, um, yeah. I, I think, I think all of these things are because, because uh, think, think about it this way, like, uh, uh, you, you you want to so the goal of your podcast is obviously to have a nice time and to chat with people and obviously yeah. as an extra opportunity you also get to talk with uh great african debaters and uh yeah. tell their part of the story and that's fucking yeah. cool but if i start asking questions of like uh, oh but you don't have uh, any uh western african debate yeah 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 or why don't you have enough people with uh this or that background it's uh um come on come on you, uh, yeah I, I understand what you're saying <laughs> i understand what you're saying because generally people also don't get that it's actually sometimes difficult getting the right people um 
people have varying schedules. You you are you have your own schedule. People have their own schedules. This is not a full time thing. This is a thing we do out of passion. And if the the arrangements don't align, I can't I can't count the number of interviews we've scheduled and cancelled and probably never got to go back to because it was simply impossible to do that, right? And so people just need to understand that there's a lot of logistics and work that go on behind that it, it's not always this and then you get the person on or, or this and then, and then it works out. And even just working through this episode, we all had to adjust on when we are meeting, we are across multiple time zones across the world. And that alone is a big um, limitation as to the people you can get on, when you can get them and all that. So just just to say, add this to, to Nikki, people just need to really, really appreciate um, the kind of work that goes in uh, before these productions come out as well. But Rumen, maybe maybe you'd be nicer. So <laughs> what has been your most unique discoveries? I will, I will say, but I just want to add to that. In Bulgarian, we have this saying, uh, if you really want it like that, go do it yourself, uh, which yeah. is how I would like to end uh, <laughs> this thing. If you, if you have a complaint or something like that, the door yeah. is welcome. Yeah. Uh, but let's be more wholesome for a second. Uh, to me, like, I think the most interesting thing is just you, you kind of operate without knowing things about, for, about people. Yeah. So, for example, I didn't know the Helena story about how she bit her tongue, uh, no. like, uh, uh, or uh, or all the stories with faithfulness and yeah. like, all of the other things, uh, yeah. because there are all the other podcasts as well. Yeah. But let's not name everything. But like these things, you can't really understand them without, uh, like, if you're watching a re- debate recording somewhere ten years ago, yeah, uh, you can't really get the context or yeah. like things like that happening. So. Uh, just learning about the interpersonal moments of people, their feelings, yeah. uh, their doubts, uh, yeah. how this, how they have evolved afterwards. Because many of these people, you know, they become PhD students, they become yeah. high yeah. positions in yeah. companies, or they go to charity and do great yeah. things like that. So that's really one thing that I I was surprised to how how yeah. deep this rabbit hole goes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, for for me, the the most intriguing part of, I've always told Erasmus is it's not probably even when I'm interviewing someone. It's actually when I'm the one on the background just listening. So usually when Erasmus schedules an interview, I'm on the call, uh, on the background assisting if he needs anything, and I get to listen to the entire episode before everyone else. And you'd see me in this chat space in the comments just writing laughing when they are cracking jokes and it's so fun to listen without having to be on camera to be composed to some degree or whatever and of course he is the one recording he has to be doing all the aesthetic stuff and i don't care i'm the one on the background nobody sees me and i just laugh my way through and you get to also listen that look, people are really really beyond what we see on the outside a lot of us have created perceptions of people or we have like stories that we've crafted around people. There's, there's an episode we had with um, B and I watching Yamiche Isaac where he talks about his individual failures or his individual struggles and, and the challenges he had. And there's somebody, almost every single person you ask within the African debate space thinks he's a serial winner. Everybody will tell you, they think he doesn't have failures. They will probably think he's never had any regrets. But when you get to listen to him and these things tell you that, look, we are all human and regardless of who you are looking at, their stories probably go as deep as yours and sometimes even way deeper than, than yours go, right? And so these are, for me, they've, they've been the, the, the most intriguing aspects of the podcast and I've, I've really loved to be on the background listening to, to some of those things. Um, so just to, to now try and wrap things up, what's next for you guys? Cause I've seen, I've seen, uh, Rumen, you started the, the channel where you break down debate emotions. These days it's my go-to because I'm, I'm not getting time to do comps and I'm, I'm prepping for HWS, which means that it's, it's really, really difficult trying to keep up with things. Um, also, I work on Saturdays, so it's, it's really, really difficult to try and do some of these things as well. Oh, fun moment here. So Erasmus is here. Mm-hmm. 
finally joining in on the fun. You've missed out. You've missed out on three million stories. And me, I'm not going to backtrack and tell you. <laughs> I, I I can imagine that. I can imagine uh, there's a lot uh, that Rumen and Nikki have been sharing over here, and I was just like rushing on my way just to get here to join in the conversation, but. Glad that at least I can get to meet uh, a bit of the conversation. Hope you guys are good. We are, you, we are talking about the uh, new YouTube channel on how to become the second best speaker in the world. It's uh, <laughs> it's a great channel. Uh, very very, yeah. very thorough advice. I, I enjoy it as well. It's uh, yeah yeah great stuff. Great stuff. Yeah, for me, I. I I try to listen to it like maybe whilst I'm doing some work, it's just playing on the background, listening to the analysis and trying to get get things going. And and if nobody has told you this, Rumen is someone I can listen to for hours. I don't know why. Maybe it's something with his voice or the way he explains things. But I can listen to Rumen talk for six hours nonstop and I'm fine. There are some people when they talk for one minute, I'm irritated. Like you, you need to, you need to keep quiet. But what's what's been the motivation with that? And is that a, a peek into what you are foreseeing um, yourself doing, like as part of the social impacting aspect w- within the future? Yeah. So I, I guess here is my big reveal, uh, yeah. or maybe not, maybe small reveal, depending on how how people perceive. We would call it big. Let's call it big reveal. Yeah. yeah. Let's call it big uh, reveal. My goal with this is yeah. after four years, although I think uh, maybe I, will, I can do it in a lower period of time. Yeah, I want to write a guide that's how to almost win worlds. So Nikki is right with the how can you become the second best speaker <laughs> of the world. Yeah, uh, and that's how that's I think how I'll name it. Maybe I'll yeah. maybe I'll name it in some other way. But this is like my internal motivation. Yeah. And I want to document um, basically the process of how I was able to do it, both yeah. in terms of like leaving it in history somewhere out there yeah. uh, on YouTube, but also in terms of if people want to do it themselves. Because I, I truly believe if I was able to do this, if if tr- if I was able through like the effort and through the support, you know, of the many people around yeah. me like uh you guys know who you are uh, uh all of you uh yeah. if i was able to do it then maybe someone else out there from anywhere on the world any any yeah. point on this planet if they have the the tools and the instruments they can do it too uh this is my uh legacy hopefully let's see yeah. if I'll, I'll be able to do it uh but yeah this is how this is how i think uh this will hopefully this will end yeah for me it's i don't know it's one of the best ways to train people because you know we have these one-off sessions but these sessions can never cover the three million scenarios that different debates will tell you and would show you and so it's so difficult getting really value from the kind of one hour two hour seminars on weighing on framing because of course those things will teach you the superficials but there are some debates where you frame less some you frame more some you probably ignore framing and you are still fine but until you have those individual assessments of these motions you probably never get to understand them and for me that has been my big issue with for some time now the kind of debate content we have out there where they are super generic and never helpful for a lot of people because you reach a certain point in debating and all the YouTube videos there become pointless because all of them are telling you the very same thing you watched on the very first video and repeating it all over again. And you go into rounds and you're applying it and it's not fitting because you don't have content that truly tells you how to apply it in the most unique situations that you meet. And so in terms of value, anybody who asks me for what do you think, what do you think I should do? Or I'm, I'm stuck here because recently people have asked, I'm stuck. I need to go to the next level. To be very honest, the only thing I do is go to YouTube, Rumen's channel, Rumen, Marin, search for the link and go like, here you go, go listen. And you'll get to understand how to approach the different types of debates that you come across. Because for me, that's, that's the best way of learning. So I really hope this project comes together for you. And I'm sure the debate world will be, will be super, super. Um, happy about it. 
thank you yeah 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 nikki what about you what's next um I don't know, this was uh, this was so wholesome. I I have no noble goals like that. I am <laughs> I I do it completely one hundred percent for myself. I do it when I want it and when I don't want it, I do it. And uh, that's stop. my motivation. Um, yeah. I I I think I'm. Uh, I I stopped doing it mostly. I have like at least five or six even more episodes that are just not edited. I I, will, I I hate editing videos. I will not do it. So uh, when I have time, I, I will pay somebody to do it at some yeah. point. Uh, but I will definitely not be doing that because I'm too lazy. Um, I, I, I will do more episodes, I think, because it's fun. And um, yeah, uh, I, I think what I realized is uh, I don't want to have a successful channel. I want to have good conversations. Um, yeah. And with that perspective, uh, it's okay to uh, not post all of the time. Uh, yeah. Because I see it more of uh, something to look back to. Because as Roman put it, these things are like um, lightnings in a bottle, like little time capsules of um, yeah. uh, different people, different eras. Roman, is that the dog? Show us the dog. Yeah, she's uh, hitting the she's hitting the the wall. Here okay. she is. Oh. We have another guest in the, in the podcast. This is Luna. Uh, That's so cute. Dog. She's so cute. Yeah. I, re- yeah. I really like Roman's dog. He has a great dog. <laughs> Roman don't think he likes about me. <laughs> that makes two of us. Can can you can you like ship the dog over or something? Is there a deal we no, can no. come to? The, there's no deal. Them. I'll give you 10 structural no. reasons. This time around, there's no fake tickets like Nikki. No, no, I can't. <laughs> eh, if there's no fake tickets, then how is this going to work? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I, so, I, I, as, yeah. as I was saying, as I was saying, um, I think I think uh, I want to do more of these conversations, but on my yeah. own terms and on my own time. And yeah. uh, if people keep telling me who should I have a podcast with, I will, I will, I will literally start <laughs> punching people. I, uh, it's, it's gonna get violent, so don't, don't do that. <laughs> just, just, just don't do that. Uh, if another Australian asks me when we will have an Australian on the podcast, I will literally murder them. Um, uh, but, but look, look, no, it's just because, guys, this is for for the Australian listeners. We have eight hours apart. It's very hard to schedule anything with you guys. So, uh, I don't know. Come to Sofia, uh, all of you, all of the Australians, line up. And I will, I will do 10 podcast episodes only with the Australians. But until that day, fuck off. And when we are able to schedule something, we'll do it. If not, we're not going to do it. And that, that that's it. That's it. I think... Yeah. I, I think for for the debating international debating community, uh, that that that's enough. They're gonna have these episodes. They can look at them at any por- point when they want. I think even now, um, all of the episodes are still getting views. Uh, there's yeah. still more and more people yeah, finding yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that's pretty cool. And um, I think that's the point. If if we can have a few generations of debaters who have listened to these conversations and have a certain point of reference throughout history, something that connects them, yeah. something that uh, makes them understand that they're part of something bigger. It's yeah. not only their own personal community in that particular moment of time. I think yeah. if, if I'm able to achieve that for some people, that's the greatest success that this podcast can have. Everything yeah. after that is for my own uh, benefit, uh, specifically of entertainment and amusement. Um, on on doing stuff for the community, I'm gonna do worlds. Yeah. I think that's pretty good for the yeah. community. Um, yeah. But my uh, complaints policy is similar to the ones of when are you gonna get an Australian um, uh, f- uh, to the podcast. Um, if you can do it better, go ahead and do it, and I'll, 
I'll, I'll be happy to to join your worlds as well. Uh, but yeah, we're gonna do that. And that's gonna be a big project, and uh, people are gonna yeah. do it. It's gonna be the best. And yeah. everything else that they have, any form of uh, time and uh, um, energy. I invested into the Bulgarian debating community because uh, yeah. I'm a I'm a I'm a nationalist, you know. I'm I'm one of the bad guys who only likes Bulgarians. No, uh, because uh, because because who else is gonna do it for the little Bulgarian kids? Nobody cares about yeah. them except except oh. the ones who are also little Bulgarian kids. So. Um, <laughs> It really, it really, it's basically like saving orphans is the next, yeah. best, next best thing. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm having fun with it. I'm, I'm trying to um, have a more philosophical approach to this part of uh, yeah. the journey. I mean, Erasmus, I'm, I'm coming to you in a bit, but we would also definitely talk about uh, Bulgaria WDC next. Um, to, to, to because we can't finish this without highlighting uh, what a festival it's it's definitely going to be. And I, I'm calling it a festival because um, I'll be there, but I'm not sure whether my priority is to debate or to enjoy the, to enjoy myself there. So I'll pick my priorities later down the line. But I just want to point this out. Rumen, and I'm sure you agree with me, Nikki does this thing where he comes off as he doesn't care about everyone and ends up explaining the things he's doing for everyone. Because he said, he started by saying, Rumen's goals are so noble. He doesn't care. He's doing everything for himself. And went ahead to list three things that he's doing for the community. Wealth, the, the Structural Regions podcast by keeping conversations that would, generations can come and watch and get inspired. And then he's helping the Bulgarian community. I'm just saying here, if you hear Evan Nikki say, oh, he's selfish, he doesn't care, he cares. Just listen to what he says after that selfish statement. It's all about caring. And I, this time round, now that the structural reasons didn't work on me, it worked on, it worked on Rumen, they didn't work on me. Uh, Erasmus, what's, what's up next for you um, in, the, in the pipeline, in the works for the future as well? Because we, we are discussing what we are trying to look out for um, moving on with our journeys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I agree with the assessments of Nikki, and uh, I have a title for the podcast, Exposing the Frauds, Part 1. Um, <laughs> <laughs> read it into two parts so we can keep the suspense here. No, but I think, I think for me, um, I'm, I'm haunted by this morbid spectacle that um, one day I'll have to leave debate, one day um, I cannot play a role within the space. So um, and I've always, the, like the number of times I've come at the crossroads where it's like, I mean, is this enough? Do I go into something else and, and just do something very well? Like maybe go into sports, maybe go into, maybe focus on my work, maybe yeah. or do more music, maybe put that same passion over there. My time with the beat is over. I always, um, I'm always held back by the fact that um, I enjoy doing this. I'm good at this and I'm able to do it alongside everything else. So I need to find newer ways of still being able to contribute to this, still being able to, to enjoy this. And, and I think I, I share um, a vision that I think this space can be bigger. For me, I think um, debating, everyone needs to debate. Like it's, it's a no brainer. The, the number of times I listen to people on the street speak and give opinions about important issues, like just go to Twitter, you'll be so annoyed and you would say everyone needs to debate because I just think it makes the world better. So if we can contribute within our um, uh, space or within our ecosystem, we can make some kind of contribution that can help to push uh, debate further, just push the content further, I think that would be good. Yeah. But then secondly, I think the era we are in is an era of content and technology and debate seems to be left behind. We're still... Um, see it very much, and I'm sure this is something that Nikki and Rumen will agree with me. Still, seen very much as an elitist sport, right? Something that yeah. rich kids from um, Harvard and Oxford do to while away their time and like later on get into parliament and stuff like that. But I think it needs to be decolonized in in the sense that it, every kid needs to have access to it. 
So if we are able to create content, which is very, very much accessible, like everyone, I encourage everyone, if you want to start a podcast, start it. Like, <laughs> like we started ours after Roman and Nikki started this because we, we want that chain reaction so that it gets to everybody. I think that is yeah. where we now see debates accessible to a lot of different people. Some people just feel intimidated. Yeah. But they have the right attitude. They have the right character. They are brilliant. We just need to keep it pushing it into their faces till they, yeah. they all get on board. And I think that it just has the capacity to make us better people. So I think for me, um, just looking forward towards the future is just to create a hub or a network where um, we, we have a lot of this content delivered precisely to the people who need them and just continue yeah. to support and help as much as possible. And maybe this hunting is, is finally over and I can have some freedom when, I'm, when, I, when I leave this space. Guys, you see, he's a serious one. I said it. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, I'm, I, 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 it just dawned on me that during Masters at, at Vietnam, there was this motion about this house to break up structural reasons. And unfortunately for them, I was up. So I was opposing the breaking up of structural reasons. And my entire case was that I can't stand for the breakup of structural reasons when I'm hosting the shaft. Because then after the breakdown, after the breakup of structural reasons, the shaft is next. The next world's motion will be about breaking up the shaft podcast. We can't do that. Yeah, it's just it's just fun seeing all of us here together doing a joint episode and, and it just popped up on me. But but yeah, for for me it's it's like I like room Nikki would say. You want to have conversations with some people and, and sometimes it's difficult to access them. And I see this podcast and these channels as my personal goal is just to grow an identity that I can have a conversation with, with whoever I want to have a conversation with. Right. And so trying to grow the podcast, trying to grow a personal identity, trying to enter spaces where um, probably it's, it will feel like yeah difficult to to enter but then you use that space to access much more um, higher level people who equally think um, in very interesting ways that you'd want to hear and all that and and for me this space um i do some facilitation and mentoring at doha debates is one of the spaces that offers me that platform as well and it's like grow it to the point where you can get people whom you want to have the conversations that you want to have. And one of the things in the modern day that gets people to talk is a big platform, a big following, a big audience. And so for me, this like, yeah, we are here. We are starting with debate. We are having these conversations. But also, first of all, there are debaters who are doing amazing things in the outside world that a lot of debaters don't know about. And so they need to know about it. And then we can reach out to people beyond debaters who are doing amazing things in the outside world. And then we can have interesting conversations with them as well. So I look forward to the future every now and then. For me, I'm not sure if I'm ever stopping competitive debates. For, I'll say it here. I've never said I'm retiring from debate. I've never made any promise or any insinuation to anyone. For people who are retired and come back, I'll be here. You go and come back and meet me. So, so for those who see me come back to comps and ask me why I have not retired, I never promised you a retirement. So when that, you see me, I'm, I'm, not I'm not shading anybody. I'm not shading anybody. I just said I've not promised retirement. If you promise retirement and you are here and you broke it, you can pick your shade and, and walk away. But but yeah, yeah, it's it's quite fascinating to see like at least different people with different backgrounds having different ways of, of impacting the society as well. But um, lastly, Bulgaria World is coming up. Uh, Sofia World right, is coming up. Um, we've, we've seen the stuff on Facebook. You won the bid. We've seen the ratification of the bid. What's next? What should we expect? Any interesting things that people should be looking forward to? Um, but even before we get there, who the hell gets up and wants to host worlds with all the stress that we've had it comes with every single year so i want to know the two of you what's the motivation for you to get up and look at worlds for me i don't see it as worlds i see it as a stress package so who gets up and orders it for free and carries it on their back and starts working around with it i want to get into what motivated you guys to start um deciding to put together a bid and then host wdc 
over a plate of pasta and red wine. This is how it started. <laughs> That's how all bad decisions start. Blind. Yes, that, that's the problem. Now, now I'm questioning whether it was a good decision, <laughs> especially with the wine. In, in, no, the, like, in uh, the city of Bologna. In the city of Bologna. Oh, that's so romantic. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah, it, it is romantic. Uh, uh, organizing majors has always been like um, a dream, uh, equal yeah. to a uh, breaking. Uh, at uh, at majors to to us so to uh, give a bit of historical importance to this uh, before we at all started debating in internationals we believed that we were very good conveners uh, here locally in Bulgaria and we always thought that if we were to organize uh, a major let's say Euros or Worlds it would be great and we did organize uh, Euros uh, and it was, I, in my opinion it was great beach parties free alcohol um like uh amazing socials things like that yeah. like to just to name a few uh it was it was great and we were like in order to make this full circle we should probably do it uh we're young we don't have kids uh so or yet so like when else is it going to be uh a moment to do it yeah yeah this yeah. is such a such a boring answer um <laughs> I I'll, I'll give you I'll give you the the real thing, and I'm one hundred percent sure that when I tell you this, uh, it applies to Roman as well. Yeah. Um, look, I think that organizing a major is the most challenging thing that you can do in debating, and it's yeah. uh, significantly more challenging than competing at Worlds or Euros or something like that. Uh, and with it being more challenging, it's also more fulfilling because you're creating an actual thing with your hands. If uh, we're not actually like physically doing it, but we're manifesting yeah. an experience and uh, we get to also enjoy it along the way. Uh, and there is, I don't think there is a more fulfilling thing uh, that you can really have in the debating community, especially uh, when you realize you kind of pulled it, pulled it off uh, and you made it uh, your own way. So uh, I think for us, it's also um, the last checkbox on the way out uh, uh, to a certain extent because. Yeah it's uh um it's i i like to think of it as a culmination to everything that we've done and uh one more challenge so that we can say that we've basically done it all because i think cumulatively together we've basically done it all we've uh, yeah. we've we've been successful at every uh type of uh, major that matters uh uh uh, meaning, uh, I I think I think worlds is the cumulative debating experience. I yeah. think for everybody, we need to we need to say worlds is the biggest thing because it amplifies everything else that we do in our own communities. Yeah. We need to have this one big thing that connects us all. And what I've yeah. realized is that uh, while uh, one of my fondest memories are uh, with regional majors, and I'm sure it's the same for you. Uh, yeah. The debating community is so much bigger than anything that you can truly understand. True. Even when you think True. your own region is big, uh, uh, even when you've seen uh, uh, all of these big competitions and... Uh, I, I never really realized that until I uh, was part of the CA team of Worlds. How oh. different and big uh, is the debating community around the world. Yeah. And uh, that motivates me even more to, to, do, to do it. And to, like Euros, when we did it, this was a very challenging and very rewarding experience. I can talk about you all day on the, how hard it was and... Uh, how, how many times things were going south sideways, yeah. but it was very fulfilling once it was done. And it's, to this day, we have great memories from it. Yeah. Um, 
And I think Worlds is going to be the same, but even bigger. And after that, we can say we've basically done it all. Uh, we've yeah. we've we've uh, done worlds uh, as a speaker. We've done worlds as an organizer. We've done worlds as uh, CAs, IAs. Uh, we've done the judging part of it as well. Uh, so now we can we can let it go. You know. Yeah. I, it's like the twenty two Jump Street end credits. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But Rumen really uh, likes a full circle because this this is another full circle you've just described right there. Yeah. yeah, for sure. But, yeah. but this is this is what this was for me. It's important about life. You need to yeah. you need to constantly grow, and you need to have the ability to let things go uh, yeah. to a certain yeah. extent. Yeah. Because yeah. when you are able to let things go, you also give it more in the moment. Uh, yeah. Like, uh, and and for for me, that's important for you to. To keep growing and this is the way that we can i think from our perspective we can grow to the next level in the debating community when we actually pull off something like this but it is very it's very rewarding very very challenging because debaters are awful they are literally the worst people ever um <laughs> but uh but it's fun it's fun yeah. because even uh, yeah. once once even those fuckers say that was a good event uh, then you can say okay that was a great event <laughs> yeah someone someone it's true someone said the the most difficult pack of people to lead is uh, our debaters they they question every single full stop every single comma every turn uh, they question the hell on your head and make sure you count it till, till it's tidy so it's like because we are very very unsatisfied or dissatisfied we question almost everything in this world and so difficult to lead us yeah um erasmus you you are on uh uh panama yeah panama the panama bid um what should we expect because me I'm, I'm panama yeah i'm coming to panama i think that's when my goal will be will be ratified in the next few months for sophia my goal will be ratified in december as to what i'm going there to do no, I'm I'm actually pretty pretty excited. Uh, I know for the last years, um, I really wanted to make it to Nikki and Women's tournament, but um, unfortunately we couldn't. Which is like the the story of <laughs> story of an immigrant. <laughs> um, but I'm really really looking forward to uh, Sophia WDC. Um, even though it's still like there, there's still like a whole world in the way, and I think as much as possible when. Uh, people who are men of the people, like men of the people, as much as possible, are getting their hands involved in things. It's, it's so much better because, like, uh, you know that they take information from the grassroots and then they begin to operate yeah. with it. Obviously, then the expectation is, is is always more, but you can always be sure that they they would be responsive to to things and and they will have some empathy right some some empathy to the different situations which are happening yeah um, i see I, I see a lot of these changes also happening with panama like for example you saw that there was opening of visa registrations as early as possible it's already open now and people can apply and these are the some some of the changes that we're, we're looking at particularly targeted at the african community to continue to ensure that their participation is included because look um Nikki is right. Worlds is a culmination of everyone else. And it's not worlds yeah. if one region is not part of it. You there's yeah. no claim to that. So as much as possible, I think I don't think it's it's a luxury, it's not a favor that we're doing everyone. It's also to be able to um have a claim on the name and to make it truly as representative as much as yeah. it is. And over the years, I'm, I'm seeing this development. So I, I do hope. The, the shifts will begin to come there because it's through access, that's how we improve competition. And it's through that competition, that's when you see the gains coming within those communities. So hopefully by Sophia, we would have um, an African team win Worlds. I know Nikki and Roman will be hoping it's a Bulgarian team, but we're also rooting for Africa. But... No, no, it's gonna, it's gonna be a Bulgarian team. It's, uh, it's already destiny. 
We could place bets here. Yeah. We could place bets. <laughs> but you can, you can, you 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 can win Panama or the one after Sofia. I don't care about. <laughs> no way. Nikki, 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 Nikki. I'm I'm storing I'm stalling my 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 retirement to 2075 because of this. So <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to be at Sofia. I'm going to compete with every fiber of being in me. Yes. Uh, but but, you know, but I, yeah. I, I think you guys. I think you guys mentioned. I think when we started debating in the circuit, we started interacting. A lot of a lot of um, Bulgarians and and a lot of people within the Bal- debaters within the Balkan region, they loved us. And people came to us and said, "Mate, you guys, you have the Balkan style. You have the Balkan style." I was like, what? <laughs> "What's the Balkan style?" <laughs> so, <laughs> so what's the Balkan style? So yeah, I think. Uh, it, it made it really, really nice to to interact and yeah. coming actually now come in debate. Yeah, I actually like really, really relish it. Uh, for me, for me, I, I would, I would be there. Uh, rumor, yeah. Nikki just Nikki just said what that the Bulgarian team will win. Okay, uh, that's <laughs> fine. <laughs> that's all the motivation I need. Now it's personal. That's all the motivation I needed. Initially, I was I was probably cruising around it. You see, I was saying that my goal will be set in December. Now it's set now. I'm no more coming to cruise or enjoy myself. I'm coming to win. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's been really nice having this conversation with with you all and and getting back together. When when I got to meet um Rumen and and Nikki in person in Vietnam, um, Rumen mentioned that I'm. I'm, I'm a year late to meeting him because like yeah, originally we were scheduled to meet him in, in Madrid and it was it was fun. Like you could see people that you were comfortable around could have similar conversations who understood you from, from your perspective of experiences as well. And it's it's really nice having this episode with with you all. Um, and Ruben, like I said, your YouTube series, please don't stop. It's my training Bible for HWS. If not, I'm dead. And so, <laughs> continue and, and, and we'll get it from there. We're looking forward to that book also. Like, if we learn how to win worlds, then hopefully we'll bring that to Sophia. So, make sure the book comes yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. We need to, first, we need yeah. to learn how to almost win. And then when we get there, we'll do the winning. We'll do the winning for you. Maybe yeah. the other Bulgarian team will write the how to win book. <laughs> Yeah. It could be them, or it, it could be me just adding one more chapter to what you wrote and said, "Well, this how to win." Yeah. <laughs> but, but, yeah. but yeah. yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks, everyone. I don't know if you have any last words uh, uh, from your end as well, Nikki. If, if there's any final words you'd like to share, I think uh, be humble and uh, do it your own way. Yeah. This is super short, probably the shortest thing Nitya has said on the podcast, but it's super powerful and, and pretty amazing, like very, very like concise. What? Like all his web speeches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, Rasmus, any final words to, to our listeners and our viewers? No, like I think my final is first is to Nick and Ruben. I think you guys are doing like a great and fantastic job, starting with structural reasons. And I think it's a revolution within the space and it needs to be supported, it needs to grow. And the love and support you guys have shown us all of our careers. Like you guys literally yeah. have, have had it in terms of building our careers within the international space. Because if no one opens the doors for you, if no one holds your hand, there's there's no way you are thriving within this space because it's it's very, yeah. very difficult to navigate this space. And um, to all of the listeners, we'll probably meet again, but I'll say that keep on doing what you're doing. It's, it's important that you believe in yourself. For me, I think that's the ultimate. When you do believe in yourself, nothing else matters again. And you need to continue yeah. to find ways uh, of, of wanting to progress, wanting to improve. Um, um, and before you realize, you you get to the ultimate and uh, and be content. So um, yeah. all the best to everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Down to you, Ruben. Uh, Erasmus didn't say anything interesting, so I'm not going to interrogate what he said. <laughs> uh, <laughs> down, down to you. What? What? Any final words to to the people listening? I'll I'll end by saying, anyone can do this. 
Uh, yeah. Like the Ronnie Coleman quote, uh, yeah. if you lift the heaviest weight, anyone can do this. So yeah. uh, keep trying. Yeah. It's, it's funny how people are saying quotes and I don't have anything to say. Um, guys, for me, I would say I'll see you next time on the next episode. Please subscribe to the channel. That's my quote. And be motivated to subscribe. That's that's the big quote I have for you. Uh, thanks, everyone, for, for joining this episode. It's been amazing. Um, it, we've been shafting on this podcast with structural reasons, and, and it's been fun uh, throughout this episode. So see you on the next one. Uh, bye, guys.